Last week, messed around and got a triple-double. You'll be surprised to hear an entry into the record books for a powerhouse program, but there's always a first for everything. And Paul Nataki said one of his goals as coach of the Torrance Tartars was to pack the stands. So, Tartar Nation jumping on the bandwagon early with some courtside shenanigans to support a recharged program. And really, is scratching one non-league W in the South Bay's oldest rivalry more important than a winning record the rest of the season? We find out with a whole lot more from around Torrance's sports scene. It's the Sports Desk, and it starts right now. What's up, Torrance? Welcome to another week on the Sports Desk. As you can see, we have a very festive one for you. And with that, we are just one more week closer to the new year. We're going to start off this week by throwing one more holiday into the mix. The Eaton Bryant Cup. What? What? Bear with me for a second. For 46 years, the two oldest soccer programs around have been going at it and battling over the cup, named after the two men who brought soccer to their respective schools. Now, think about bragging rights and the smack talk that comes along with crosstown rivalries. When that rival can say, your school hasn't beaten us this century, well, we're talking about Obama levels of mic dropping here. But if you can reverse the fortunes and end that argument, bringing home a trophy for the first time this millennium could be cause for another holiday after all. Since the early 70s, there have been two Torrance schools going at it on the soccer field. A game that current players look forward to all season long, and a game that alumni would do just about anything to be a part of again. When I was a little kid, I used to sit in these stands, all of the West Torrance would show up here, all of South Torrance would show up over there, and there'd be a knockdown war going on a um, couple of times a season. And I remember watching those games from here. Um, I started playing here in 1977. Every game against South mattered more than any game against anybody else, against Bishop, Torrance, whatever. It was a West-South thing. Uh, the Southwest rivalry is one of the, you know, it was the longest rivalry in California. Um, it's been going on, I think, like 50-something years. Um, it's been through CIF, through different things. I know, you know, being a South guy, uh, I think 2000 was the last time we won here against the West. Once a rivalry, always a rivalry. Whether you played in the 21st century or back in the 70s, if you were ever a Spartan or Warrior soccer player in your lifetime, you know exactly how meaningful this game is. Having been a Spartan soccer player myself, I'll never forget the feeling of playing under these lights. It's funny how a rivalry can bring a few extra fouls, a few extra goals, and a little extra energy when there are bragging rights on the line. I know for a fact that a lot of these kids play together, West and South, on club teams. But it's different. It's West versus South tonight. So I'm seeing them knock each other over, you know, doing everything they can to win the ball. It matters. It's in the blood. And again, I can't explain it. It's West versus South. It definitely brings out the competitiveness. I mean, you can tell from the first little bit in this game, guys are flying around crazy, tackles, challenges. The ball's moving quickly just uh, in any sport. You know, it's going to be uh, hard fouls, a lot of competition because it's about pride. And, you know, when you have games that are about pride and about, you know, local relationships and derbies kind of, it always brings out the best in all the other all guys. Rivalry games are the best games to play in. I mean, the intensity just gets picked up so much higher and it's just, it's more emotional and you're playing for, you're playing for more, it feels like. Everyone plays their best in this, for sure. Everyone, both teams are looking forward to this. They want to show up their friends, their enemies. We both know that what's on the line, bragging rights is mostly. And bragging rights between South and West don't end after graduation. They carry on into adulthood, at least for the players of the 70s and 80s. We play every year up at Nansen Field early June, and it's all the 70s and 80s um, South and West players going at it up there. It's actually more humorous now than, than chaotic, but it's, it's a lot of fun. Although bragging rights are probably enough, there is a little extra incentive to winning the rivalry. A trophy called the Eaton Bryan Cup, named after two coaches who originated the South and West soccer programs, is awarded to the winner each year. That winner gets to hold on to the trophy until the following year. South, however, hasn't seen this trophy in quite some time. I've never seen it or I'm not sure it exists because West has held it for the last like 12 years or something. Last time we beat them was in PKs last year, but I guess that doesn't count. But if there is a trophy, I want to hold it. <laughs> The Spartans will gladly take over the trophy and cherish this win for a long time to come. And maybe, 
Just maybe, when these current players turn into alumni, they too will be back to share their story of their long overdue win in the Big South vs. West rivalry. Uh, this rivalry is the biggest thing, thing we look forward to every year, more than CIF, more than everything. Winning this game means everything to us. Uh, running through my mind is just pure elation, ecstasy. I'm so happy that we got that win. Undescribable feelings. You can lose all the games in the season, but if you you know you can't lose to West. Same thing, you know, with a lot of other schools and a lot of the sports. There's that one team that you can't lose against, and West is it. You know, West is the one for South. Thanks for that, Haley. The win for South doing more than just notch another W. They managed to turn some heads before the match, earning a nod in the CIF Division Four Power Rankings. Remember, this time last year, this squad wasn't even on that radar. As of that week of the Eaton Bryant Cup, they are edging up to a top five position. Meanwhile, no surprise from their classmates, the Ladies of South, also in the Division Four rankings, sitting pretty in that third spot. The Pioneer League packing that list with three squads, South, Torrance, and El Segundo, all in the top 10. Keeping it on the West High campus, a year ago, the biggest news in world sports was the decision to take wrestling out of Olympic competition. Meanwhile, during all the debates about pros and cons to including wrestling in the world's biggest event, the sport continued to grow worldwide, just maybe not how you'd expect. A new face on the sports desk, Rachel Brady, shows us how Brian Notch and the ladies of West High are debunking their fair share of stereotypes. Wrestling doesn't favor any race, gender, size, culture, or stature. Brian Notch isn't kidding when he says that. Yeah, a lot of people came up to me and they're like, you're in girls wrestling? And I'm like, yeah, I am. Like, it's a lot of fun. They're like, really? And yeah, I'm in wrestling and I enjoy it and you should join too. But it's, it's a big shock for a lot of people. It's a lot about life lessons. If you ask any of the girls in here, any of the guys on the team, they're going to tell you that we teach a lot of life lessons, the stuff they do in here, their work ethic. Um, they're going to take that with them into their schoolwork, their jobs, you know, just outside of school. But with the different weight classes, um, you know, everybody of every size can wrestle. There's, you know, there's no discrimination in the sport of wrestling. This is a first year team, like it's our first matches. It's like a lot of firsts in one year. And so it'll be like something cool for this community to experience. He brings the same tough mentality to the mat with the boys of West High as with the girls who wrestle for him. He says there's just a bit more giggling. It was big for me when the cheerleaders came because when people see like this cute cheerleader who's flying through the air wearing her like cheerleading outfit on the wrestling mat, you know, want to, you know, push people around and kind of bang people around, um, it really kind of helps and the other girls see that, oh wow, there's cheerleaders out, so we can come out. So that was kind of a big thing for us. Not just like, kind of like our dad. So like if we come to him with something, he'll help us out. Or if we have a problem, we can talk to any of the girls and they'll like help us out or we'll help them out. And it's just, it's like a big support system for all of us. This may be the first women's wrestling team for West High, but this diverse group of girls are just an example of a sport growing around the world. Women's wrestling is huge. There's a lot of college programs now. Um, at the international level, it's huge. Uh, the Olympic Foundation, if you win medals, when you're in, in the World Championships and the Olympics, they pay you. So um, since I've been here, there's been a lot of girls that I've seen from other schools. They've won guys CIF. They've went on. They're wrestling internationally right now. So there's a lot of opportunities for these ladies to wrestle in college now and, and get school paid for and use it as a tool. At West High, reporting for the Sports Desk, I'm Rachel Brady. Okay, everybody, we're going to take a break here. Stick around because when we come back, we've got some hoops updates from around town, including a local standout dropping the first ever at his school of the game standard for a, quote, big game. This is our friend and colleague, Donna. She has liver disease. She planned to present this message herself, but she can't because she's in the hospital. We can change this. We can help people like Donna remain active mothers, loving friends, and productive members of society. But we need to work together and contribute our part of the story to medical research. It's ironic because that's what Donna planned to talk about. People like you know what it's like firsthand when a doctor gives you a scary diagnosis. When that happens, you want to know all of your options. But the information online is overwhelming. That's why we've been working on a solution. Rather than struggling to find the researchers and support organizations focused on your condition, you make it possible for these professionals to find you instead. You simply answer a few questions about yourself and your health, and then you decide how much of that information you're willing to share, to whom, and for what purpose. Please join us at Registries for All, regforall.org. 
In America, up to 1.6 million youth are homeless each year. Up to 40% of them identify as gay, lesbian, bisexual, or transgender. Most of them have been thrown out of their homes or run away out of fear and rejection. It's time for things to change. America's next generation needs us to stand with them so they can stand on their own. Get informed, get involved. Visit 40 tononorg Hi, welcome back to the sports desk. Time to hit the hardwood. But first, let's explore the standard of, quote, today was a good day across sports. The hat trick, for example, is hockey's tip of the cap to scoring three goals in one game. Not bad. Baseball has the cycle, or on the flip side of that, I played plenty of ball my whole life and racked up more than my fair share of golden sombreros. But none of those top basketball's golden standard. Ice Cube sang about it, and he was just messing around. But the point is, he had a good day. And I bet you'd be surprised to hear how many good days Bishop Montgomery's powerhouse program has celebrated in its history. Bishop Montgomery hosted Legacy High School from Las Vegas for their first home game of the season and absolutely dominated. First quarter, Blake Miles fights for a rebound and throws a cross-court pass to Stevie Thompson for an easy layup. Right after, the Knights jump into a full-court press, forcing Legacy to a five-second call. Stevie Thompson sinks a three off of the screen, grabs a steal, and dishes it to Blake Miles for an easy two. And the Longhorns call a timeout out of frustration. Knights up 7-0. Second quarter, it was all about defense. Stevie Thompson blocks a three-point shot, which leads to a layup from a pass from Justin Bibbins. To end the quarter, Justin shoots a pull-up, misses, grabs his own rebound, and throws up an off-balance jumper. Fouled and won making it 58-21 to 21 at the half. Second half, it was all about Justin Bibbins. To start off the third, JB pulls up for an easy three, hand down, man down. Next play, grabs a steal for an easy layup. But the show doesn't end there. JB gets another steal, pulls up for a three, nothing but net. JB finishes the game with the first triple-double in school history. The Knights' defense was the key to this win, only allowing Legacy to 21 points in the second half. Final score, Bishop 104, Legacy 36. The Knights are currently 6-0 in the season and ranked 5th in the LA Times. Thank you, Raina. Almost a year to the day, the last time the Knights put up triple digits, 104-36, to that is what we call in the business a boat race. Meanwhile, this season for the Torrance Tartars carrying a completely different storyline. Managing less than half a dozen wins a year ago and a new face coaching them from the bench this year, you gotta imagine fans were more than ready for a fresh start. When we first introduced Paul Nataki as the Tartars' new coach, transplanted from across town, he said one of his goals was to pack the stands at home games. But how crowded and how rowdy can you expect it to be for a team that could count their wins on just one hand a season ago? And apparently the answer is, who wouldn't pack the stands for a team that could count their wins on one hand a season ago? Torrance played environmental charter at home, where their defense was a major factor in this dominant win. In the first half, we didn't play, we didn't, we gave up too many points, and so going into halftime, coach was like, don't give up more than 10 points. And uh, I think we only gave up like six, so our defense in the second half stepped up, and we're proud of our guys. Steal after steal allowed Abdullah Nazar Khan and his team to get easy layups to beat the White Tigers by a massive 55 points. Uh, I was just successful by playing passing lanes. I mean, I was able to read uh, the passes and jump and get steals and finish uh, in the pass break. So I was able to get most of my points on there. And uh, my, te my teammates set me up for a lot of jump shots. So. Well, we, uh, we mixed up some of our pressure. We had a couple different full court presses and different half court looks. And so uh, I think that bothered them a little bit. And uh, we're a little bit more athletic. Uh, than this team, and so we were able to use that to our advantage. Not only was the Tartar defense overpowering, but so was the student section, bringing plenty of Tartar spirit to the game. And Coach Paul pumped us up really good for the game, and the crowd was awesome, and it was really um, great just to see them, and it pushed us to play harder and to score more. It's cool. I mean, playing at home, we want to get as many wins as we can, and winning by 50, we get the crowd into it, and it's just fun. Uh, we knew we would play behind our crowd and uh, our crowd really bring it tonight. We had drums and it, it was exciting. It was fun. We had a huge flag, a mascot. and then. Uh, but our guys were just really excited to come out. I just told them bring the energy, bring the hustle and uh, really just showcase all the hard work you guys put in in the off season. So it was great. 
Leading the team with 15 points, senior captain Abdullah Nazar Khan helped the Tartars win their second game in a row, giving them an overall record of 4-2. They look to continue their winning streak and confidence in their upcoming games. From Torrance, this is Valerie Ortega reporting for the Sports Desk. So far, things looking good on the Torrance campus with their new coach. That win bumped them up to 4-2 on the season. Remember a year ago, they finished 5-21. Plenty of reason for optimism now, but remember, they also had as many wins this time a season ago before dropping every game in January and the second half of December. Okay, everybody, second and final break of the week. We've got another visit to the court. This time, it's a squad and a coach entering her sophomore season at the helm of the Pioneer League contenders. Here we are, 2013. We all depend on technology to communicate, to bank, and none of us know how to read and write code. The first program I wrote asked uh, things like, what's your favorite color, or how old are you? I wrote a program to play tic-tac-toe. I first learned how to make a green circle and a red square appear on the screen. You're just trying to make something, trying to transfer something from your mind to the computer or to, to a tablet. is. Uh, it's, uh, it's an experience. The whole limit in the system is just that there just aren't enough people who are trained and have these skills today. The programmers of tomorrow are the wizards of the future. You know, you're going to look like you have magic powers compared to everybody else. Great coders are today's rock stars. That's it. I tell people I have three kids, one of them's adopted, I just don't know which one. I can't imagine having to be in a birth mother's position to make that choice. You know, I was kind of just asking her, you know, what is your motivation, why are you doing this? And she looked at me and she said, because you can give my son a life that, that I could not. We always tell her thank you, he is such a blessing to us. Every day is just a ray of sunshine from her, so. We're Chanda and Brian, and we chose adoption. Hey everybody, welcome back to the Sports Desk. Time to just jump right back on the hardwood. When Lauren Kamiyama took over the North Saxons in 2012, she took a look at her roster and decided she'd teach her squad how to play to their strengths. There were no standout athletes with exceptional size, so hey, I guess we're going to play a lot of solid team defense. And that settled it. Tamer Lada checks back in with the Saxons today to see how Kamiyama's personality and influence is carrying into her sophomore coaching season. When Lauren Kamiyama accepted the head coaching position in 2012, her decision was not based on the school or the players. It was about her true passion for the game. I teach at a middle school on the south side of town, which is kind of ironic, I guess, because the kids I teach actually feed into South High. But um, when the job opened up over here at North, uh, I applied A because I used to coach high school over in at Cerritos High School. and so. Um, I, I loved I loved it when I coached, and to get back into coaching, uh, I mean, it was just a good opportunity to take advantage of. Her coaching debut could not have gone any better, and she hopes to do equally as well as last year, or even better. Uh, honestly, we just, I mean, I expect a lot of the kids. I demand a lot from the kids. Um, our goals this year, at least to get to the quarters like we did last year, and not, if not, go further. Um, I, think, I think this year we're further along as far as uh, skill and teamwork wise um, and so just getting further than the quarterfinals is our goal right now. Hopefully we'll go far and hopefully it'll be a fun season. I think our, our team is really good this year because we got good freshmen and good seniors and like all around we're just a really good team. Without any standout players, the Saxons will rely on teamwork for success this season. Last week they competed in the Downey Tournament and went undefeated. This is the first time they have taken the championship title. Growing up, I played on a team that it was all about team. It was never about just one person scoring 30 points a game and give it to this person, stand and watch them or anything like that. So um, I'm, I'm very fortunate that we don't have a superstar and we just work together as a team. I think that not having a superstar, then we all know that everybody contributes in some way. And without all of us together, then... You know, it just doesn't seem like it'll work out too much. With the nine returning players and the Pioneer League title race wide open, North might have the biggest advantage winning their division. 
I mean, being a first-year coach, trying to implement a new system to kids and having them catch on takes a while. And so uh, having uh, a bunch of returners back helps. Um, just being further along, familiar with the terminology, expectations, and uh, what we're trying to do as coaches and what our philosophy is. Thank you, Tamara. And one last bit of news before we wrap things up for the week. A familiar face up in the college football world making some headlines before bowl season kicks off. Chandler Jones, the former Bishop Montgomery Knight, doing his thing up at Juan's alma mater, San Jose State, earning all Mountain West Conference honors. Of course, making the conference his first team good news, but the big news, really the ridiculous numbers Jones put up in 2013. Jones, the go-to guy in the Spartans' pass-happy offense that topped about every chart in the nation this year, 1,356 receiving yards made him number five on the list of FBS leading receivers. His 17.1 yards per catch is the highest average by far of any receiver with over 70 receptions. Just to give you some perspective on how impressive of a stat that was for Jones as he'll enter next spring's draft, the next closest wide receiver on that list, Michigan's Jeremy Gallon, with 80 catches for a 16.1 yards per catch average, landing him all the way down at number 65 in that category. So, the all-conference honors tell just part of the story. Jones even joined some stellar company. His 15 touchdown receptions set State's single-season record. Not too shabby, considering he shares a history book with another Spartan great. And no, we're not talking about me. James Jones, the Green Bay Packer who led the NFL in touchdown receptions just a season ago. See, I do my homework on this show, always trying to find the most random who to thunk facts and trivia for you. Meanwhile, if you've got your own interesting facts about a local athlete, maybe somebody making a chase at the record books here in Torrance, just check in with us online. The Sports Desk is on Facebook, in case you haven't heard. You can always shoot us a message or a simple hello if you miss me too much over the holiday break. All right, everybody, that wraps it up for you. We'll see you next time in 2014. Have a good one.